Thank you for choosing CTN. And now, it's time with Herman and Sharon. <laughs> I love you. Thank Hello. you so much for joining us. This is my first wife, Sharon Bailey. Yes, probably probably his last wife, maybe. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Because this year, <laughs> in May, will be our 57th anniversary. Yeah. Yes, and you know you're going to hear that many, many times. Right. In the meantime, because he loves to say it. I know it. And <laughs> we have we have a guy today. I am just so honored to have him. I really am. In fact, we, we are doing two interviews today, and the guy I'm having right after him, which you'll meet later, I'm not telling you, but it's an honor to have him also. It, it, it's amazing. This is, this is like my honor day, really. <laughs> but uh, Josh Tully uh, is, hey, he's written a book. And I'm telling you, if you look at the cover, you can't, even come close to explaining what the words in this book tell you because you cannot determine it by looking at that cover. This is one of the cases where you can't tell a book by the cover, okay? <laughs> and he's even had some criticism on the fact that he's got the cross on there with the money on it or whatever. And, and his, when I read that, his criticism, I go, people are amazing. They really are amazing. They'll come up with something out of nothing, but good to have you, man. Good I mean, to be it here. Is, it is such an nice honor. To have Thank you, you so uh, much. Uh, it's an honor to be here. This book, as I was telling Sharon driving into the office this morning, I said, this is the kind of book that I read, and I read again, and then I pick <laughs> it up, and I reread it again, because this is new stuff, and I love stuff that no one else is quoting. This guy has his own lane, and it's called Evangelpreneur, and that's that you coined that word. I did, yeah, yeah. Talking about entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurship and evangelism, obviously evangelism comes first, but how you blend those two things and, and why it's so important to do we so. we got to hear about who, who Josh okay. is. The, this he's, is got the, a, he's got a great he background. Is, he is. Uh, you know, it, it's so interesting <laughs> when I read about the way the Lord uses people in such amazing ways. Yeah. And he just kind of plucks them out of a whole millions of people and says, I want you to do this. Uh, he's a motivational speaker, a radio and TV personality. Uh, the, the Josh Tolley Show is a nationally syndicated talk show with listeners in all 50 states as well as 160 nations. Yeah. Wow. How do you open your radio program? Uh, usually with some sort of uh, piece of news that I know just gets my attention. I, I try really hard not to have the opening pre-planned. Like the, the rest of the show, I'll kind of have an outline for. <laughs> I, like, I like your mind, really. <laughs> but I want, yeah. I want to be yeah. just as surprised yeah. as everybody else and go on the <laughs> yeah. same adventure as everybody else. So that's usually, I, I don't know how I'm going to start the show. As the music is yeah. queued up, I'm along for the ride. I did a radio show for three years. Talk live with Herman Bailey, and that's exactly, that's exactly what I did. I like, I don't want to, I don't even, in fact, I would tell him, I don't know what I'm going to say. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the first time I did a show, I, I prepared, I had like a stack of stuff, yeah. four or five inches yeah. thick, and I blew through it all by the first commercial break. I was so nervous <laughs> that's right. that I said, well, I'm just going to wing this thing, and it, yeah. it went so much yeah. better from there. Oh, I got a winger. I love that. <laughs> uh, in October 2012, he served as a national television anchor for the Free and Equal Election Foundation presidential debate. Yeah. That was a hoot. What do you think about our debate? Oh, my goodness. The, the, the political process in this country is so messed up. The fact that we don't even have debates. A real debate would be back and forth, response rebuttals. Mm -hmm. We have basically a moderated arguing match. Yeah. Yeah, and it. whoever wins but, the popularity contest but the moderators is the winner. want the fight. Yeah. Oh, they, I mean, and that's they, what they're trying they to feel. do. They, yeah. they like, the guy standing next to you said he hates you. Oh, what do you absolutely. say about that? Absolutely. <laughs> when, when, when it comes to issues, you already no know substance. where they stand on the issues. Yeah. Yeah. What's left yeah. is, is all the high school bickering, and that's yeah. unfortunately what people get excited about. It, this guy has appeared on CBS, NBC, TBN, all over the place, and you were even in martial arts. I was, yeah. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's kind of how I got out of my shyness. Okay, your opinion about MMA. Uh, MMA... <laughs> 
<laughs> anytime you give an opinion about MMA, you're going to get in trouble. Uh, I, I think MMA is amazing. It's it's great. It's a sport. Yeah. There are uh, certain rules that you follow, and I think that those those people who train in MMA are able to transfer the, that skill set to the real world, as long as they continue to keep in mind yeah. that the world is not an octagon. Yeah. The world is not flat. <laughs> you good. are not in shorts, yeah, right. and yeah. your other guy's yeah. not going to line up yeah. next to you. That's mixed martial arts, yeah. in case you're wondering what MMA is. Uh, <clears throat> chapter one, I'm going to walk through this book sure, a little yeah, bit, yeah, yeah. okay? I've got something in mind maybe later down the road that we're going to have with, with Josh, if the Lord puts all of that together. Uh, you say, and this is a quote, a church of, of believers in bondage. And you give an example, which is amazing, the Crystal Cathedral. Yeah. And kind of walk why this chapter, a church of believers in bondage? What are you saying? Well, right now, we find ourselves in a position where tithing is at record lows, church debt is at record highs, number of churches being foreclosed upon is also at record highs. And I had a, a major player in the lending industry on my show, and he said, Josh, not only is it at record highs, but it's worse than what is being reported because nobody really wants to be the bad guy and repo a church. If you really knew how bad the, the financial state of Christianity in America is today, it would look like a rotten apple. So, so many of these churches are in bondage. Yes. They're in bondage to the debt that they've somehow accumulated. Mm -hmm. And what's really sad is they're not under control of the Holy Spirit. They're not under control of God's direction. They're under control of the financial system that they place themselves under. And that's serving two masters. And that's really, really dangerous. And the Christa Cathedral that was an icon. Oh, it was. It was. Now think about it. This is a, a, an organization that had tens of millions of dollars in operating budget. How do you go from tens of millions of dollars of people just giving you money to a point where you have to declare bankruptcy? And it wasn't a situation where there was, you know, one person embezzling money or anything terrible like that. It was just mismanagement of funds. And it's interesting how that cathedral, I mean, th that was kind of like the hallmark of where to get motivational speaking and, yeah. you know, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And that's the one that had to declare bankruptcy and then sell their location to the Catholics. Wow. Because we don't understand godly financial principles. Next chapter. The root of all evil. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know you've heard this. Everybody's heard it. Uh, you, it this is interesting because I, I love this caveat. Uh, even though we feel that, yet you point out in your book, the most asked questions from fathers uh, when asked for the hand of their daughter. Here it is. How do you plan on providing for my daughter? Yeah. Isn't that interesting? It but is. yet, money is the root of all evil. And yeah. even the dad would say that. Oh, absolutely. And, and we have this idea that money is the root of all evil. And of course, we know it's the love of money is the root of all evil. Right. And in that chapter, I kind of define what love is. Because I remember I was talking to a bunch of Christian men, many of them fathers. And I said, if your daughter came home with tattooed Timmy and said, Daddy, I'm in love. I want to marry this guy. What's the first question you ask? How are you going to take care of her? What's the second question you ask? How much is the wedding going to cost me? And then somewhere around question 10 or 12, we get to, son, are you walking with the Lord? Yeah. And these are from people right, right. who are like, oh, money's not that important. It's not, it, it's not a priority. And when we look at what love is, how do you love your wife? You spend time with her. You think about her when you're not with her. You try to figure out ways to make sure that she's happy with you in your life. Well, how do we love money? You think about it when you don't have it. You're always trying to spend time with it. And you're constantly coming up with different ways to, in order to make it happy in your life. And, that's, and we don't identify that in uh, Christianity. That is true, Josh, whether you're poor or rich. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Matter of fact, <laughs> greed. I redefine greed in there, too. You can be just as greedy when you're poor as you can when you're rich. Sure. I mean, what, what is greed, right? Sure. Greed is placing money above the things that are supposed to be important. So when you say, oh, family's important to me, my church is important to me, my community is important to me, but we're going to move for an extra $2 an hour, that's greed. I understand that it's not a millionaire in a limo with a cigar or something, <laughs> but it's still greed yeah. because you're placing money above those other things. That is amazing. The Bible, you say, talks more about money than it does heaven. Mm -hmm. It also talks more about making money than giving it. But for some reason, these are two issues that pastors across this country just do not want to bring up. We're either, right. in pro we're either in a poverty gospel where money's not important except for that 10%, <laughs> yeah. 
or we're in some sort of weird prosperity gospel where you buy a handkerchief for 900 bucks and you're supposed to be a millionaire by Tuesday. <laughs> and the reality, the reality lies someplace in the middle that we just don't want to cover. Yeah. And it's more than getting out of debt. It's more than making sure you tithe. There's a godly way to make money. And I don't believe any church should have the audacity to ask for money if they're also not going to teach you how to biblically make that money. Mm. Very good. Bullseye. Yeah. Amen. Right? I have to digest that one, but that is right on. <laughs> wow. Getting out of debt is never enough. Explain. No. Well, there's this phenomenon, and I'm not, I'm not picking on anybody, but there's this phenomenon in Christianity that when it comes to any church that does teach financial principles, it's always about getting out of debt. Well, getting out of debt is not enough because let's, let's put it this way. Let's say you eat beans and rice, you work that second or third job, we know that the more hours you work at work, the higher the rate of divorce, the higher the rate of suicide, the higher rate of teen drug use and pregnancy in the home. So you're risking that. You have to ask yourself first, is more employment worth the risk to marriage? Now God, I would think, would rather have you homeless living under a bridge with your family, kind of like everybody we see in the Bible, as opposed to making sure that you're working three or four jobs. But beyond that, beyond that, we have to also say, okay, so let's say you do all that, somehow your marriage survives, your children survive, you get rid of the debt. Well, inflation, and, and I document this in the book, inflation has effectively been between 7 and 10 percent every year since 1871. That wow. means if you're not learning how to make more money, how to biblically make it, in 10 years, your money's only going to be worth about half what it was before. And you hear this all the time, I seem to be working harder, but I'm making less. <laughs> That's why. Mm -hmm. So when you just get out of yeah. debt, what you do is you place yourself in a position where unless you change how you make money, it's, you're, you're going to be in a worse position 10 years ago when you don't have the ability yeah. to sell the RV and you're getting a little bit too old to start working two or three jobs. And there's this phenomenon in churches where it's now actually worse than it was because we just thought getting out of debt and maybe buying a condo and renting out the other half was enough. And it's just simply not. Yeah. You say that getting out of debt works. Oh, it's good. But it's Definitely also it. like a yo-yo diet. Absolutely. Now explain what you mean because you, you would think that would be the end all. I'm out of debt. Everything's paid for. <laughs> now I'm on my road to being a millionaire. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Yo-yo dieting, we're all familiar with that. You lose 10 pounds, you get off the diet, and you gain 15. You lose 20, you gain 25. Yeah. Yeah. And we do that same sort of thing with debt. When you initially do a get out of debt program without learning how to make money and without learning what money is, how inflation works, all this sort of stuff I cover, when you get out of debt, you lost your 10 pounds of debt. But then because you didn't learn how to make more money, we now see the number one car or the number one charge on cards is food, it's living expenses, it's no longer the toys, but you still aren't making more money, so now you're actually going in debt in a, in a larger sense and it's going to be harder to get out of it again. And that's a phenomenon I coined as yo-yo debting. And uh, uh, no political party, this is your words, can fix the middle class. None. It's not even an option. No. They hope that, you don't that's have the a most talked or... about political uh, <laughs> words that come out of their mouth. Right. I'm going to take care of the middle class, especially right. the Democrats. Yeah. You know, because they're supposed to be the ones that care about the poor. Not. <laughs> but yet, that's what comes out of political opponents' mouth. Right. And unfortunately, they need a, a calculator and a pen because they don't understand math. See, what happens is no economic model that's based on employment can last more than three generations. If you go back three generations ago, we came out of the New Deal. That generation, it worked. Uh, your parents, they might have retired with a home in Boca. You know, it, it, it worked. Yeah. Dad got the pension. That next generation, it kind of worked. But we started getting what's called reverse mortgages. See commercials for those lately? Oh, yes. Yes. So yes. now we have the 60, 70-year-olds who are in a position where, okay, we did the whole employment thing, but it didn't give us the result of mom and dad. Okay. And it, if, if you remember the movie Dirty Dancing, you see that? Oh, movie? yes. Yeah. I always ask myself in the 50s, now this would be that first generation because uh, the dad, the, yeah. the patriarch in that movie was already yeah. kind of old. So that generation, they were allowed to go on vacation for three months in the summer. I'm, I'm watching this movie thinking, how do they afford <laughs> three month vacation? <laughs> yeah. But that was that first generation. That second generation, you guys, it didn't quite work out so well. The third generation, they're telling us don't even plan on it. And that's because no employment-based economy has the ability to keep up with that inflation. You're not getting 10% raises at work and if you're not you're going backwards yeah mm -hmm. so there's why no does, way why does inflation have to keep going up why 
Oh, that is a whole complex. <laughs> Forget it, huh? Yeah, Could it, does it have anything to do with $19 trillion dollars right now? <laughs> it has a little to do yeah. with $19 yeah. trillion dollars and raising debt ceilings. And, and I explain Never it in the down. book, but it's, it's, it's kind of monotonous. And yeah. they even changed the math. This is how evil these people are. They changed the math on how inflation is calculated. So they don't include things like housing or food. Yeah. Even though you need food, water, and shelter, yeah. they don't include that when they calculate inflation. Mm -hmm. They put in there things like superconductors or something. Yeah. How, how on earth is yeah. that supposed to calculate my, my cost of living? Yeah. And it, it, just go, go to the grocery store and you'll see how yes. much it's going you, up. You, you've got you've to cover this because I hope you get a book. When you see that website, go to his website. You'll find out every place he's going to speak, mm -hmm. which will be a, a treat for a lifetime. But then you can get all of the materials and the things that he has written because he is unbelievable. But this right here is really... $70,000, you would think, and I'll guarantee you, because I pretty well know the Christian Television Network, sure. there's not one person here, including yours truly, that is in the $70,000 annual bracket. And this is part of the reason why they cannot fix the middle class, because they don't understand it. When I heard what poverty is and when I heard what middle class is, I've been training business leaders for over a decade now, and I looked at these numbers and I said, this is impossible, I'm gonna do it myself, I'm gonna find these numbers. Yeah. So what I did was I took the 12 foundational expenses, nothing exaggerated here, took all real data, national averages, right? And this is what I came up with. Rent, $1,000. Now it might be less in Biloxi and more yeah, in yeah, New York, yeah. but national average. But but this is Florida, and, yeah. and, and, oh, and yeah. of course we're seen all over the country, so take it wherever you are. Yeah. Right. So rent $1,000, car insurance 144 cell phone 73 I wish. I haven't had a yeah, $70 right. cell yeah. phone bill since 1995. Utilities 264 cable and internet $100, food 332 gas 220 car payment 466 savings for retirement, because we're all doing that, right? Uh, <laughs> 395 college loan payment on average 575 life insurance 33 health insurance 402 Now, nothing on there is exorbitant. We're not yeah, going on no. vacation. Yeah. You better live someplace warm, because I didn't even put clothes in your list. This is $69,600 a year. What he just talked about there. That's I what know. you would that's what you would need to make. Absolutely. Okay. And in, a lot of people here probably would not have the student loan. Oh right. Yeah. Exactly. So you, you can subtract that. So you can it, subtract yeah. it. You yeah. can subtract it and you and let's say Josh, I don't have a car payment so hallelujah. Great. Yeah. You can cut this in half. Yeah. Yeah. You're still at $35,000 a yeah. year okay. to be poor in this country. Okay. Now with the let's use the 70,000 that you use here uh -huh. number. After taxes, what do you what do you have to spend? Well, that's that's it. So it's 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 sixty nine thousand six hundred dollars before taxes. Yeah. You take at, at that bracket, you're at thirty two percent. You take that out, yeah. and you're poor. That's it. Yeah. You're done. Yeah. You have nothing left over. Yeah. Yeah. Which is why so many thirty year olds are now living with mom and dad still. Which is why so many people have credit card debt five to fifteen thousand dollars because you have to somehow subsidize the difference. You know, it's interesting when somebody uh, asks you. You know, let, let's just take the seventy since we're talking about that, and you were to say to somebody, well, I make seventy a year. You make seventy thousand a year. I, I mean, you don't make seventy thousand. No, <laughs> no. When you get finished, the liquid is yeah. what? Yeah, maybe Which, forty. Maybe, yeah. but then you take out your expenses and you're at zero because that takes you literally right. down to zero. You have nothing. People except are for living paycheck yeah. to paycheck. They Just are. about everybody. They are, which is why Christianity has to fix this problem. Because right now you have non-believers coming into the church, right? And Jesus fed them, then he healed them. He, uh, or he fed them, then he preached to them. He healed them, then he preached to them, right? And people ask me all the time, Josh, why don't we see miracles in America with people regrowing eyes or regrowing feet? The reality is that we can create fake feet now that are so good that if you have them, it's considered cheating if you're in the Olympics. So God has given us this knowledge and ability to, to come up with the answers. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. But where our financial pain is, is finances. Yeah. Suicide will kill more people than traffic fatalities. The number one cause for suicide is financial stress. So when you look at this world, you have in the Western world this total, I agree with you, money's not the most important thing, and I cover that. But... You have non-believers coming into the church and they're saying, wait a second, I went to college, got college loans, I have car debt, house debt, credit card debt, I'm fighting with my wife over money, we have no money, we're broke, help me. And the church says, well, go to college, get a good job, get in debt, get house debt, get... we're doing the same thing. And they say, wait a second, wait, wait, 
I thought you said you're in the world, not of it. Why are you teaching me the exact same thing the world teaches me? You just slap a cross on it and expect it to work. When the Bible says employment's actually not something you should be going after. Employment is something you should be getting out of because employment puts you in a position of servitude. Where you live is not determined by you. It's determined by your boss. Where you get to go on vacation is not determined by you. It's determined by your boss. How much you give to your church and if you get to go on a missionary trip is not determined by you. It's determined by your boss. So you are literally literally a servant to that boss. And the Bible says you can only be servant to one. Boy, you're right on. Absolutely right on. <laughs> In fact, you give an example. If you made $250,000 a year, you got that one? <laughs> it would take 4,000 4, years to become a billionaire. Yep. $250,000 a year when you have time, do the math. It would take you 4,000 years to become a billionaire. Yeah. And you're saying, every suggestion is, don't get rich quick. <laughs> you don't buy that, do no. you? No, no, because I own a calculator. And I know that seems like a little harsh, but, but seriously, I understand the rule of 72. I understand what your financial planner is telling you. I totally get, get quick. it. What is the rule of 72? Rule of 72 is the rate at which your money doubles. Yeah. So this whole idea that, that you can somehow save your way to prosperity just doesn't exist. It's never happened in the history of the world. There's no billionaire that's 4,000 years old. And what we're seeing is people who retired, they, they put their money away, and now that savings isn't working. I, when I do my seminar, I actually detail with, with the financial institution's own data and prospectus, and I show how it will not work, which is why we have so many people, like uh, a guy who used to live in my neighborhood, he bought his house and paid it off before I was even born. But because they've told him to put 10% of his uh, $75 a week paycheck away, and that he would never live through the $150,000 that he accumulated by the time he retired. Well, they're telling people now, if you're 20 years old, you're going to need $7 million to retire. And I had a, a client come to me about your age, and he said, Josh, they told me I would never outlive 250. When I had it, they told me, well, you're actually going to need a million. I got that. They said, that's not even close. You're going to need at least four to five million. He said, Josh, it keeps going up. I can never save my way to wealth. And that's an absolute truth, which is, God, which is why God gives the example of the people with the talents, where it says, go out and actually make money. And it's not an evil thing to do. And we used to teach it. And the church used to teach it. We just stopped doing it about 100 years ago when employment became the dominant so source of income. So we should all start our own business. Is that what you're saying? Well, not necessarily. Well, well you're, I would you're, love that. you're saying if you want to make it, it's not going to be employed. It's never going to be through employment. Cannot so it's happen. what you do extra. It's what you do extra. And that doesn't mean that you have to start a business and be the one that works the store or makes the widget. That's not it at all. I have a chapter in there called Save the Gravy, where retired people who don't have the ambition or even the desire to start a business can still get involved by helping start uh, other people through their startups. Yeah. And that entrepreneurship still allows you to leverage your income to a point where you now have multiple streams. <laughs> you, I mean, it gives great ideas. I was reading this one, and I mean, it, it caught my attention that you know how you go into these uh, uh, like 7-Eleven or whatever and the bathrooms are usually just a mess yeah and they stink <laughs> and everything and he talked about tell them you will do their bathrooms mm -hmm. and at uh, X amount of dollars and you keep multiplying how many and at the end of the year it's it's like up to a hundred thousand dollars yeah that you could actually do just from this idea yeah yeah, and, and this is something that I really want to... That's just wanna, one, by the way. Exactly, and this is something I really want to point out. I don't have a business for people to get into. I don't have a, a program to flip houses, buy property, sell candy bars or anything. I don't have any of that stuff. And not that it's bad or evil, but that's not it. My, my whole point is the Bible teaches us to be entrepreneurs. That's what it says the default career should be. Let's get back to that. And this whole idea that you need money to make money is ridiculous. And number four lie, you have to be special. Yeah, you don't have to be special. I'm not special. So, I mean, this whole idea that you need some sort of MBA or you yeah. need some sort of bankroll to fund you. I have helped people who have zero dollars start businesses and get into that 70000 bracket within a year. And I've helped people who are literally formerly homeless do the same thing. Wow. So you don't need all this stuff that society tells you you need. You just need the truth. You're absolutely right. I interviewed a few years ago this young lady that used to live in her car. And she became mm -hmm. a millionaire. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. She became an entrepreneur. I mean, it's, so you're absolutely right. And you talk about the Bible does not talk about retirement. Not at all. No, no, nowhere does it say, okay, and Peter was done, so he went back to being a fisherman on the Sea of Galilee. <laughs> it doesn't talk about that. You are supposed to live a life of purpose for your entire life. Mm -hmm. But what has happened is when we get into these jobs and we think, well, we're going to work this for 40 years until we can buy our retirement. And I compare that to, to servants and laborers in the Bible. What was a servant? A servant was somebody who they didn't have an option. They went to work for their master, right? And when their work was done, did they get to go home? No. It, it was kind of like if there's time to lean, there's time to clean. You were given something else to do until the end of this day. And then if, if the servant was luckily, lucky enough to save up enough and buy his own freedom, he could get out of servitude. Today we call that retirement. And then if, if the servant wanted to spend the rest of his life with that master, he could go to the city gate, put it all through his ear. We call that tenure. And we are literally creating employees, a.k.a servants and we're not realizing it. Whereas a laborer was somebody who was a small business owner. If I knew how to fix fishing nets, I could go down to the sea, fix some nets for a certain price. I could glean a field for a certain price. And Jesus even uses entrepreneurship in his parables and says, nay, wait a second. These people who showed up late, why are they getting paid the same as we are? He, they negotiated the price. It's up to me to pay them, right? So they, that's an example of small business ownership. When the job was done, I'm done. I could travel up to Bethlehem and fix roofs. And it's amazing. Even with the Hebrew slaves, you see a picture of entrepreneurship. Wow. Share Christ, about a minute and a half. Yeah. That's your camera. Share Christ in a minute and a half. How do you share eternity <laughs> in a minute and a half? That is amazing. It is. And I, I think what it comes down to is asking yourself, are you an accident? That's what happened for me. I, I asked myself, is this all chance? Did I go from goo to the zoo to me? And it didn't make sense. So I started looking and I realized that the Bible, this Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the only deity that said, I am God. I studied all the world religions and it's the only one that said, I'm God. So I thought that's a great place to start. And that's what I would suggest to you, just start. Just start reading it. And the Holy Spirit's gonna talk to your spirit. It's going to make sense and the rest will take care of itself. There's no freedom like the freedom that you get through yeah. Jesus. There's no mm -hmm. salvation. I, I, throw away the money, throw away the stuff. It's all about eternity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you look at eternity, you have to look at it with that same sort of future planning, right? You're working for somebody for 40 hours a week to plan for your future retirement. Wouldn't you want to plan for your eternal retirement? And that's the message I have for Christ. Make that decision. Pray with that person watching right now. Heavenly Father, we just pray that those people who had their hearts tugged on today during this show, Father, those people who have that knot in their stomach right now, Father, we just pray that they embrace that, Father. Let that, let that feeling not make them angry, Father. Let that instead encourage them and, and convict them. Let them know that that feeling, while it's painful, is the truth being revealed, Father. And I pray that Paramount, Father, even more than, than learning the truth about evangelpreneurship, that they learn the truth about why you created them and the destiny that you have for them, Father. Let let them just have open ears, soft hearts, and, and a mind that is, is processing the written word to such a point, Father, where you bring conviction into their heart and salvation to their soul. Amen. amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Get your book. Yes. Get your book. I'm telling you, it is one of the best reads that you've ever had. Bye-bye.